Hi World Lit people! I hope you're doing well. We're going to change countries. We've been in France for a couple of lectures and this time we're going to move over a little bit to the west and we're going to hit Spain. We're going to talk about Cervantes. Miguel Cervantes. M-I-G-U-E-L C-E-R-V a-N-T-E-S Miguel, M-I-G-U-E-L Cervantes C-E-R-V-A-N-T-E-S Miguel was born in 1547 and he died in 1616 1547 to 1616 He was a pretty smart guy had a good education, he was great with numbers, he was a good student, and he had a lot of those virtues or skills, you know, he had the ability to write, he had the ability to do some math, uh, he was a pretty good speaker, uh, he was good with his hands, he did a lot of manual labor, he was a builder, a construction person. So he had a lot of those skills that those Renaissance people thought was really important to have. Uh, he uh, went to war he joined the Spanish Armada, you know, the biggest fleet in the world at the time, in the 1570s. And he was a member of the Armada. He and his brother joined the Navy, the Spanish Navy, at the same time. And they served Spain in the Armada during the Spanish-Turkish War in the 1570s and 1580s. Spain went to war with Turkey. Well, while they were sailing around in the Mediterranean Sea, pirates captured the ship that Cervantes was on. For some odd reason, the pirates thought, 1575, they thought that Cervantes was somebody important, somebody influential, somebody wealthy, of high standing. He wasn't. He was just an ordinary sailor. But he couldn't convince the, the pirates who captured his ship otherwise. And so the pirates took him as a prisoner and tried to ransom him. Remember I said that a lot of people in wartime captured their enemy and then sold them back. Okay, that's how they got money. It wasn't necessarily about killing people all the time although that was pretty rampant too. But if you needed money, you tried to ransom somebody. Okay? They had him for years, and nobody would pay a ransom for this poor Miguel Cervantes. Okay? It's like me being kidnapped. Nobody ain't going to pay nothing for me, you know what I mean? He wasn't wealthy. He, he was not influential. People didn't know him. Miguel who? But the pirates wouldn't let him go. Okay, they just knew somebody paid something for this guy sometime. So, as the pirates would dock, come to dock on, in, in their ship, they would put Miguel Cervantes on the dock in chains, handcuffs and chains and manacles, and put a sign on him for sale, okay, for ransom. And nobody would pay anything for him at these different places they'd go. Nobody knew him, big freaking deal. Until they got to Algiers in northern Africa, there's a port in Algiers on the Mediterranean Sea, and they put a sign on Miguel for sale, for ransom, please. And so somebody felt sorry for him on shore, a, a, an important um, desert ruler, leader, a pasha, and the pasha paid his ransom, gave him extra money so that he could go home to his family back in Spain after five years. Five years of slavery on a, slave sh on a pirate ship. Well, whew, he gets to go home. Hallelujah. And Spain is really rather impressed. The king of Spain is really rather impressed that this guy survived this horrendous ordeal, you know. And so Spain may gives him a really cool job. He becomes an accountant for the Armada. He's got these math skills, you know, okay? So he's in charge of keeping books for the Spanish Armada, okay? 
order and supplies, paying for them, making sure that the supplies are doled out to the right people, the right ships, how much stuff cost, blah, blah, blah. Well, he wasn't as good at math as everybody had thought. Okay? He had a pretty good, well-paid job. Auditors came to check his books. They were all wrong. It looked like he had been stealing money from the Spanish Armada. He was mortified. It was not true. He was not an embezzler. He was just a crappy accountant. <laughs> the Spanish uh, Navy arrested him, threw him in jail. Threw him in jail. Um, he stayed in jail. He was in jail until 1605. Uh, while he had been an accountant for the Spanish Armada, he married, he had a couple of kids, he had one child out of wedlock, um, he had his own home, you know, and was living kind of high on the hog until the auditors discovered his bad math. And while he was in jail, he thought a lot. He tried to expand his mind he tried to escape the rigors and the horror of being in a Spanish prison by daydreaming, okay? by coming up with these outlandish, fantastical plots and characters. Well, when he was released from prison, he decided to write a book that he had conceived of while in prison. And the book was Don Quixote. Don Quixote is spelled D-O-N-Q. U-I-X-O-T-E, D-O-N, capital Q, U-I-X-O-T-E, Don Quixote. And the hero of Don Quixote is a guy named Don Quixote. And he is a man who kind of lives in an alternate reality, kind of like Cervantes did while he was in prison. Don Quixote sees the world through rose-colored glasses. He sees the world as he wishes it to be. Wouldn't that be nice if all of our dreams could come true? Well, Don Quixote wanted to make it so. Okay? And Don Quixote would see something. He would see a woman in distress, and he would think of her as a beautiful maiden, and he would go to rescue her, even though she was just being yelled at by her husband. He would do battle with the husband and sword fight. He saw a field of windmills, and he thought they were giants, and so he went to kill the windmills. That's where we get the phrase, a giant killer? Rail against the windmill? You can't be them, but boy, we sometimes sure try, don't we? We have problems that are as big as a giant windmill, right? So Don Quixote sees the world through rose-colored glasses, and he sees the world as a true knight in shiny armor would behave. That old Middle Ages convention, okay, where there's a knight in shiny armor to protect the young, to protect the innocent, to extol the virtues of the good, to live the perfect life as a hero. Those people don't exist. Don Quixote falls in love with a woman named Dulcinea. Sweetness. That's what he calls her. And he thinks that Dulcinea is the most beautiful, virginal, kind, sweet, innocent lass that he has ever seen. He's so in love with her. She's a whore. He wants to see what he wants to see. He doesn't want to see reality. And how many people have we known in our lives who don't see reality, don't see others as they truly are, have a real difficulty in perceiving what is reality and what is not? That's a real psychological problem, you know? Well, Don Quixote suffers from that. Don Quixote has a companion, his sidekick, who is called Sancho Panza. 
S A N C H O P A N Z A. Sancho Panza. And Sancho Panza feels so sorry for Don Quixote that this old man, and Don Quixote is an old man, that this old man just can't see the truth, that he needs help to live in society, to live in reality. And Sancho Panza follows Don Quixote on his old broken down donkey and is his aid, his companion, his medieval page, as a knight would have a helper as a page. Don Quixote is told in episodic chapters. Every chapter is a new ordeal or adventure that Don Quixote goes on. Um, kind of like Gargantua and Pantagruel, there's not really a linear plot of one thing happens to affect another thing. So it's kind of a collection of all of these adventures and events and experiences that Don Quixote has. Um, it's been an extremely, extremely influential book in Spanish literature and in world literature as well. I've not read the whole thing, but parts of it I have read. And when I start reading it, I really can't put it down because it's kind of comical. You feel sorry for this old dude who sees things through his own eyes, that he wants to make the world what he believes that world might very well be. And in essence, what Cervantes is doing is poking fun at the Middle Ages literary conventions of chivalry, of knights in shining armor. Because does that really work? It's a foolish concept. It doesn't make sense in the real world. So if you really were a chivalrous knight in shining armor, it just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't be, a, it just wouldn't be right. Um, we have, um, where's the word I want? It's funny. It really is kind of funny. Um, picaresque, that's the word I'm looking for. The word is P-I-C-A-R-E-S-E. Q E period. <laughs> Picaresque. P I C A R E S Q U E. And a picaresque is an adjective that describes some types of literature. A picaresque piece of fiction concerns a hero. Is just a little left of center, okay? He's not really trustworthy sometimes. He tries to get one over on the rest of society. He lives his own way. He might be a little bit of a criminal. Think Huckleberry Finn. Do you trust Huckleberry Finn for nothing? He faked his own death. He robs people. But oh, he's the little innocent boy on the on the River, right? Think Little Big Man. Has anybody read the book Little Big Man by Thomas Berger about Jack Crab? Almost forgot his last name. He is a crab. Jack Crab, who claims to be 118 years old, and I fought with Custer, and I was the only survivor of Little Big Horn, and I shot Wild Bill Hickok, and I lived with Indians. Really, Jack? You really did all them things? I doubt it. It's a picaresque novel. Jack is a bold-faced liar. Can't trust a thing, single thing he does. Same thing with Don Quixote. You can't really trust him because he doesn't see reality. He sees what he wants to see. So Don Quixote is um, uh, a unique character. Very, very Spanish. Um, and it pokes fun at traditions developed in the Middle Ages. So that's Don Quixote. Have a great day, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.